Well, it's good to see you all here tonight. And as the weeks go on in September, we get more and more of our family returning from far off places and the room gets fuller and fuller and I love that. I was also traveling this summer. I was in the US mostly to bring my son to university, but I also had a trip to Chicago that um, I'll tell you about. It was actually a trip to Oklahoma with a, a few hours in Chicago on a layover. I was headed to some meetings at an organization called Voice of the Martyrs that I want to tell you about a little bit later. But since I had a few hours in Chicago, I got on a train and headed into town to see the Art Institute of Chicago, which is one of the world's greatest art museums. It's amazing, a sprawling museum. It's large, several floors and buildings and a campus. The museum has a, a grand staircase leading into this enormous entrance with tall glass sliding doors through these stone arches. And the museum was amazing. I've shared some of the paintings that especially struck me on my social media and even in our church WhatsApp group. But it has made me think about the way that some people understand Christianity. What if I never made it past the lobby? What if I got into the lobby of the museum? <laughs> through the doorway and didn't get past there. I think that some of my Christian friends think of the whole edifice of Christianity simply as the doorway and once we've gotten in, they just keep talking about the doorway. How wide those lovely doors are. The shininess of the marble floors in the lobby. We get our ticket and just stand there in the entrance. And maybe you're standing there in the entrance, impressed by the beauty of the entrance, of this building and trying to convince other people to come on in. How great this lobby is. But we haven't even yet seen the art in the museum. So I mean, someone comes down from deeper in the museum to, to tell you about some of the things that they have seen. They want to show you the beauty that they have experienced. They want you to stand in front of some of the paintings that have impacted them. But most people are just satisfied to lounge on the lobby sofas. Or they're looking for the toilet. Or they're trying to find out if they sell Diet Coke in the cafe or looking for the cheapest possible souvenir in the gift shop. And some people will be mad at you if you talk about the things that you have seen on the other floors of the museum, annoyed that you can't just be satisfied with this beautiful lobby. Look how nice it is in here. Such lovely sofas, shiny floor. <coughs> I just want other people to see this place, they might say. And you think, okay, that's great, but you haven't yet seen the museum. You're still in the lobby. There is a depth to the gospel, to the kingdom, a depth in Christianity that is worth beholding. There is beauty deep in the museum that's worth exploring. 
I was reading recently in preparation for my own studies and struck by realizing that over the last 50 years or so, there's been a, a gradual return to Christianity in the intellectual academic world. It's been philosophy departments that have led this transformation, bringing back rational arguments for the existence of God, for the truth of the gospel, deep thinking about the nature of God and the nature of ultimate reality and ethics and even epistemology, how we know the things that we know. There's been a gradual return to Christianity in the intellectual academic world, and it has been impressive. Over the last few decades, some prominent atheists have made now professions of faith, recognizing that some of the deeply held principles that we have, the, pri the kind of principles that we take for granted, some of them have roots in Christianity. And it's difficult to explain why we would think that they are true apart from Christianity. I want to talk about two of those principles. The first is that we believe that all of human life is of equal value. We believe that all human life is of equal value. That's a deeply held conviction. People debate about whether we are consistently upholding it, but almost everyone would defend it. Just about everybody believes that. And that comes from Christian truth. That idea that has become so deeply rooted in our cultures, in our societies, in our governments, in our laws, it comes from Christian truth. If you have your Bibles, you can open with me to Genesis chapter 1. This is the passage that describes the creation of the world, and beginning in verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. In that passage, especially the second part of that passage, we see God giving responsibility to humans to care for creation, to care for the earth. And Christians have sometimes reluctantly, but gradually come into an awareness of, an acknowledgement of their responsibility to care for the earth. But the start of this passage describes God's creating mankind creating mankind in God's own image. That phrase, the image of God, one of the most influential ideas in the history of the world. That you and I were created in the image of God. 
male and female, both in the image of God. Not one in the image of God and the other in the image of something else. Male and female. In God's image. And the image of God, it doesn't describe, of course, God's very large body, a very big head and long arms. Rather, it describes qualities of God, characteristics about God that we share by virtue of being created by him. So God is a thinking being. He has an intellect, and so we have intellect. God is a, a being of emotion, and so we have emotion. God feels, and so we can feel. God has a will. He is a, a being that chooses. He makes choices, and so he has given us will, the capacity to choose. God is a being in relationship, and so he's made us beings with capacity for, even desire and need for, relationship. Those are some of the dimensions of what it means to be created in God's image. There's a, a deep way, a, a truly beautiful way, that we look like God who made us. We are made in God's image. Something else that this passage is emphasizing when it says that we are created in God's image. The author here is contrasting what he's describing, this way of understanding our relationship with God. It's very different from some of the other ancient Near Eastern religious understandings of God. In those religions, humans made an image, made a statue out of stone, out of wood, to represent their God. And they would pray to it or hope that the God would inhabit it so that it could genuinely represent that God. But in Christianity, we don't build a statue. We don't build an image out of stone, out of wood, because God has already done that. And it is you. You are the image of God. And you represent God in the world. You are the image of God that he himself has made. It's a profound idea. It's deep. And it, it has implications for everything else that we think about people. Notice also that the passage ends with this idea that This thing that God has done, this world that God has made, it, it isn't just good. It is very good. Very good. My Hebrew teacher, when, um, when I performed well on an exam, he would write on the top of my exam, Tov, good. And when I did very well, he would write, Tov, me'od, very good good. God made this world and declared that it is told me, oh, it is very good. You live in God's good world. That is amazing. This is God's good world. So many things follow from that. For example, we don't believe in Christianity that this life is a test. God isn't standing far off looking down at us, testing to see if we can be good enough to get back to him. He has made his good world and has made us as in his image for it and in it and has invited us to participate with him in its goodness and in its renewal. Because we know, of course, that creation, although good, also bears the corrupting influence of evil. And so we join with God in the renewal of all things. An invitation to participate, not a test to see if we are good enough. But that idea that we are made in God's image, the idea that has drawn a good number of philosophers and thinkers to reconsider Christian truth, is the idea that Human rights is dependent on this thought. 
the concept of human rights, that humans are created of, that we have equal value, intrinsic worth. It, it depends on this idea. Apart from God, it's hard to explain why we would believe it. The idea of human rights, of course, one of the most influential ideas of this century. <coughs> this is why we condemn oppression and persecution and discrimination. Because we were made in God's image and therefore all humans have equal value. For this reason, we condemn slavery. We condemn rape and sexual abuse and violence against women because we are, all of us, made in the image of God. We fight for the rights of people with physical and mental disabilities because they are equally valuable. Our value isn't dependent or connected in any way to our intellectual capacities or to our physical stature or to our race or ethnicity. By virtue of being human, you are made in God's image. And so you are, all of you, of equal value. said that I was on my way to Oklahoma to visit an organization called The Voice of the Martyrs. It's a really great organization, an excellent group. I have been privileged to get to know some of their work and to participate in some of their projects around the world and to benefit from them. They exist to defend the rights of people who are persecuted for their religious faith, particularly for their faith in Christ. When I went, I didn't realize how big an operation it is. There's hundreds of people who work there in this big campus, and they are sponsoring projects and helping thousands of people all over the world. It was started by a man called <laughs> Richard Wormbrand. He was a Romanian man who was persecuted under communist Romania and he was tortured for his Christian faith. He was eventually freed when communism fell and started this organization, The Voice of the Martyrs. At the VOM headquarters today, there's a replica of Richard Wormbrand's cell in his Romanian prison. It's moving to sit in it. It's, a, it's today a, a small prayer room. And they have their walls to commemorate martyrs around the world, including the names of some of our friends who have died for their faith in Turkey. There is a beauty, a deep beauty in the Christian message, in the gospel edifice in the museum of this faith that is worth exploring deeply, that is worth beholding. I want us all to get out of the lobby. We aren't just trying to get into the building, but see its depth. Some people in the academic world are are rediscovering it. I love that. I love that I get to be a part of some of that. A second truth that we take for granted, which has its roots in Christianity, the kind of truth that's difficult to explain apart from God, is the idea that it is better to endure suffering than to cause it. It is better to suffer than to cause suffering. Better to endure suffering than to cause it. It's, um, even to say it almost seems so obvious, but it has not always been, and apart from this message, would not be nearly so obvious. We believe in that truth because of Jesus. Luke 
23. This is the passage in the Gospel of Luke where Luke describes the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. Our Bible has four biographies of Jesus, four accounts of the life of Jesus. Luke is one of those biographers, one of those men who gave his whole life to telling the story of Jesus. And in chapter 23, he gives us the account of Jesus' death, beginning in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull. They crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching. And the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then Jesus, he said, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' death is not just an inconvenient truth. It isn't an embarrassing end to an otherwise successful life story. The death of Jesus, the cross, is not just something awkward that Christians are left trying to make sense of. The cross is at the very center of both the message of Christianity and the Christian way of life. Jesus, in his dying, gives us a model for living. He teaches us a way to live in his dying. A way of life that includes surrender. That that is the good way. To give yourself. To suffer instead of causing suffering. To let yourself be a source of life for others. To suffer on behalf of others. To work for others. To sacrifice yourself to save some. Apart from God, apart from the example of Jesus, it's difficult to explain why we should believe that. Why should you believe that it is better to give away your life and we do believe it. I suspect that almost all of you genuinely believe it. It's true. It is the kind of deeply beautiful, true thing. It's worth exploring. It's worth spending your life beholding. The work of peacemaking and reconciliation, that these are virtuous pursuits. That it's worth giving your life to peacemaking, 
to reconciliation. Well, it's, it's difficult to explain why that should be a worthy pursuit apart from Jesus. Even careers like being a firefighter. You know, we think of firefighters, at least in my country, firefighters are heroes. We just think of them as heroes. We think of them as heroes because they are the ones who run into the fire when everybody else is running out. That principle, that view of firefighters as heroes, it is because of Jesus that we think that. You can behold the beauty of that picture if you leave the lobby. Explore the depths, the beauty that is the gospel of the kingdom. It is a story big enough to live in, deep and big. I found that once you start to behold the beauty of the depths of the kingdom, everything changes. It changes gradually. But I found that the, the faith you want to express, it doesn't look like the happy, clappy, superficial, soft rock, sappy, cliche, kitsch Christianity that some of the lobby dwellers are satisfied with. The gospel is true. The gospel is not true despite the evidence. Our Christian faith is not a faith we believe it despite the evidence. That's not, that is not the case. The gospel is deeply true. And the deepest thinking and exploration confirms its truthfulness and its beauty. Christian truth is a deeply beautiful thing. In my conversations here at Exile, I'm often talking about the fields of study and work that my friends have chosen, that they're pursuing at the university, or jobs that they're trying to get. And often, these are friends who love Jesus and who sometimes struggle to see how the gospel of the kingdom touches their fields of work and study. And so I want to take my next few messages in the weeks to come to explore how the gospel of the kingdom touches all of your fields of study and work. Who in this room is a university student? Any students in this room? There's a few. Oh. Uh, can I hear some majors? What are you studying? International, International relations. Industrial, Industrial engineering. engineering. Yeah. Some others? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Game design. A gastronomy, physical therapy, tourism. Yeah. A couple others, anything else? What? Graphic design, nursing. Any architecture students in the room? Yeah. Interior design. Interior design. Software engineering. Actuarial science. Again? Actuarial science. Actuarial science. Excellent. Let me tell you that it isn't a stretch. It isn't as if it isn't as if, it isn't, isn't as if it's hard to discover or hard to discern how the gospel of the kingdom touches all of those things that you have just described. The gospel of the kingdom, the depths of this museum, it addresses all of those things that you have described. It includes all of them. They are all a part 
of this gospel of the kingdom. I hope that we can help to explore some of those connections, some of the ways that the gospel touches those things. Christianity has shaped and continues to contribute to the scaffolding of the world, the moral and intellectual framework of the world that we live in. I'm only just exploring it. I'm only just beginning to behold its beauty. Moving past the lobby, I want to invite you to do that with me. Let's move past just the entryway into this gospel of the kingdom and look to explore its depths. Thank you.